truth is, I am Iron Man. Son, hat. Backs off. I know Kung Fu. Yippee-ki-yay, mother And here, warriors come out to play. I ate his liver. When we call drug to send it full street Baptist church, we call a sin and sin. We're around here, between Normandy and Weston, we call this here a little twin and twin twin. Welcome back to the Why So Serious Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon, and we're finally getting back to our weekly episodes. Uh, we've been on a little bit of a hiatus with my travel across the country, but we're good to go now. Uh, but today, I'm thankfully be joined by uh, two of my favorite wrestling podcasters and all overall cool people, uh, Rich Van and Cameron Hawkins from the PW Torch. What's up, guys? How's it going, man? Good. Appreciate good, you. Good, good. I... I, I... So rarely do I get to be called cool in an environment where, like, people don't, you know, throw shade on me like my wife. Um, so I appreciate that, Brandon. <laughs> oh, I appreciate no, that. Y'all definitely are cool people, uh, some of my favorite people. And uh, we're back because uh, yesterday was, oh, this past weekend was the Royal Rumble weekend, so a big weekend in pro wrestling. So we're going to kick the show off uh, talking about Rumble weekend. Uh, Cam and Rich may drop out in and out between this show they got some stuff to do it's a monday so you know we all got stuff but they'll be here for the most of the show so if you hear them dip out they'll be back um but uh first uh rich overall what'd you think about rumble weekend nxt and the rumble overall oh man i, I thought uh i really thought the the whole weekend was awesome nxt of course there hasn't been a bad takeover and they they've continued that trend i thought the five matches they picked were awesome choices then you run right into the rumble i I didn't get to watch the pre-show i tried to do a little self-care there but i heard the matches they were even good and uh, the biggest complaint i had was while i thought the overall rumble was good it was just long man just so long and that that took its toll both on the crowd and on the people viewing at home yeah yeah same same here cam what'd you think yeah, i mean just about the same thing um you know nxt it's it's that thing where you look up um, you know, living in the central time zone, you look up and the show's over and it's like 820. And it's like, oh, there's there's still there's there's more day. There's more life. Um, but, yeah, that's it's a strong show. Um, I love that, you know, Undisputed Era is just they have this way of opening up the show and just having being so high energy and having near falls. Um, if, if they could open every wrestling show ever, it'd be fantastic. Um, you know, overall, just a, a great show. The story that they're telling with. Gargano and Champ over the last couple of years is so organic and so three dimensional. It's really different than anything I've seen in wrestling. You know, being thirty three, um, just just a different layered story that it's been really impressive. Um, you know, the talent that they had there is incredible. Um, you get to see what kind of a star like a Velveteen Dream is, who's not even on the card but gets an amazing reaction. So, just a great show. Um, you know, the Royal Rumble felt like the Royal Rumble. It felt like a big deal. It felt like everything mattered. Um, you know, to echo, you know, both of you guys, it's just so damn long. Like, that's <laughs> it's a real commitment, you know, watching that show and being invested in it the whole time. Um, I don't know who the audience is for a show that long. You're absolutely getting your money's worth, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot to, a lot to take in a lot to see. Uh, but overall, just a, a very important show that felt important that had strong storyline ramifications and great performances from great performers. Yeah. But not, not only that, it's not even just who the, um, it's not even just who the audience is. It's the audience itself. They get burned out, and it ends up hurting the show. So, like I said on Twitter, like that Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles match, in another setting, people probably would have loved that match. But in that setting, it kind of died to death with those people. And it doesn't mean it wasn't a great match. It's just it just came after so much stuff. And that women's rumble was 71 minutes. So, And it ended on what – you know, I know Cam put this in his poll for the um, East Coast cast, but what match should have ended the show? That match should have ended the show because that was – that's the biggest star. That was what was going to be the biggest pop, and it was hard to bring people back after that. Um, so let's just go over – let's just say a few things about a few of these matches, and then uh, we'll get that over with. So starting with NXT, uh, Rich, what did you think about War Raiders and Undisputed Era? 
I think Cam hit it well when he said how good the uh, Undisputed Era did in terms of kind of setting the energy. And I know Wade had mentioned a few times that uh, I appreciate that the Undisputed Era, when they're in situations like this, they always defer. It's kind of like one of the podcasts I love listening to, uh, the BMF cast, a couple of dudes I know in Florida. They talk about the idea if you're writing a bad movie, you can either go with cool or you can go with crazy, but you really don't go with something in between. So I think with them, they could be jerks or they can be cool. And they always err on the side of being jerks. And that makes it a better experience because then you see them as uh, what they're meant to be, as opposed to what they could be in terms of those, you know, Adam Cole's the best example of that. He could live off the Adam Cole baby face or heel for years. Instead, he does things that makes you outside of that hate him. Yeah. Uh, Cam, what'd you think about how the War Raiders performed on the big stage for the first time? I think that if you're a relatively young wrestling fan, that act um, is new. Like a, a Legion of Doom, Road Warriors type act is, is really new to you. And th- they just have, like their look is great. Um, the fact that, you know, they really like live that life, lend itself to that. Anytime you can bring like some type of, uh, some type of a Caucasian warrior to play. Triple H is going to ride with you the whole way on that. And so they had like this big elaborate entrance, but um, I'm just super impressed with, with Hanson. Um, and they're both really good. They operate great as a team, but Hanson's athleticism, finding ways to keep up with a, um, you know, a Kyle O'Reilly and a Roderick Strong. And I keep up with, I mean, they do different things, but I um, mean, does a fantastic job showcasing his athleticism and just the near falls that they're able to produce. Um, I, I just thought it was amazing. And War Raiders are absolutely a get and a quality team. And you could just tell by the reaction, like from that live crowd, as new as they may be, um, they, they respond to them like they've belonged there forever. And they absolutely do. Yeah, absolutely. I agree uh, with both of you guys. Um, the next match was Matt Riddle beat Cassius Ono in about nine minutes. Um, Rich, is there any doubt that Matt Riddle is going to be a star? Like, to me, he's like <laughs> Kerry Von Erich reincarnated, but can actually work. No, I mean, to be fair to Kerry, when you're trying to work on one foot and lie about working on one foot, that's a little <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> like, yeah, that's the thing about him. Like, he's like, hey, I can wear a so barefoot if you need me to. Carrie's like, uh, I'm good in the boots. <laughs> Bruce actually has a story about, like, he would get in the hot tub and people would, like, the guys who knew would be like, you going to take those boots off, Carrie? And he'd be like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. And so, yeah, I agree with you. Riddle is just, he's got the, he's the package. He, he has the charisma. He has the moveset. He has the ability to pull people in. Um, I know, uh, the idea of seeing him like a lot of people i heard sam roberts talking with wade on the torch about the idea of like people see him as a stoner so surfer dude type and maybe he's a little softer i was like i've never heard of a ufc like to me and i'll I'll let y'all speak to it as well like i always saw the people that were like the most chill in those sorts of scenarios are the most dangerous or the scariest it's not the guy who's telling you, I'm going to throw you through a window or tap you out or something like that I worry about. It's the dude who's just like, chill, man. You just went to sleep for a few minutes, bro. We're going to wake you up. It'll be fine. Yeah, he's the type of dude that you'll see at the bar or something, and you think, like, you, somebody might run up on him, and then and then the big fight comes out, and you realize that was the wrong person to run up on. That's 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 uh, that's Matt Riddle. Um, Cam, what do you think? Oh, similar. Like after I, right after I graduated college, um, and I won't, you can find the clip online. And if you, if you do your Googles, it'll make sense. But, um, there's this bar in Austin. Um, and there was like a fight of street. Uh, this guy I knew that played, uh, played linebacker at UT when we were in college. Um, it's like an outside altercation and he ends up pushing a girl out of the way and a guy gets in his face and he's like, yo, you don't push girls like that. Um, and so this guy who is, you know, you know, 5'10", but a solid, you know, 230, um, you know, playing linebacker UT, um, runs up on the guy and gets promptly knocked out. <laughs> and the guy who knocked him out was Roger Huerta from UFC. And, and it was like, you don't know until you know. 
and and Matt Riddle, you know, carries himself like a guy who doesn't want problems, but he'll bring the problems to you. And that's the best thing about the character. And just, you know, you forget that these UFC guys are, it's very rarely like a Brock situation where this is something I picked up in my 30s. This is what they've always done. And just his athleticism, his ability to move, as real as he makes this thing that is, you know, only so real. I mean, he's amazing. And I think he's going to be a huge star. And, you know, he's it's funny somebody was asking what's matt riddle's character and i was like are there so many white people walking around smoking weed that matt riddle's character doesn't make sense to people <laughs> but no he's you know he's a, he's a guy with a certain personality type who happens to be an all-world fighter um so yeah it's just i think he's gonna be huge i think they put him in there with the perfect guy in ono and his story that's being told is, is great as well just yeah they can't say enough good things about matt riddle yeah and i love the finish like you don't see that often in pro wrestling but like submission from strikes, just beating the hell out of somebody so they can't. So unique, anymore. so good. It yeah, was such a um, such a brilliant finish. Um, mm-hmm. Next match was Johnny Gargano defeating Ricochet for the NXT North American Championship. Uh, this match was incredible. Um, I was just watching this match, and it's just like, like Johnny Gargano is great, and he and he and he kind of generals the match. But every like Ricochet is just like like superhuman. Like I don't I don't understand how he does the things that he does. And the biggest thing with me is that when he does the things that he does, a lot of people come out and they have a, a quick hot spot in early in the match and they do a dive or a tope or they do some type of flip and or they'll just save it to the finish and their finish is like a frog splash or a four fifty or whatever. But Ricochet is doing like all types of dives and crazy stuff throughout the match after taking the beating 15, 17, 19, and in this case, 23 minutes into the match. Uh, Rich, what did you think about this match and uh, Gargano and Ricochet? Uh, I like Gargano and Ricochet. I think those dudes are crazy. Oh, hold on. I got to go time out. All right, cool. I'll be back. Well, good well yeah, and I'll jump in there. Um, I, I think that Ricochet just makes it look so easy. I think he's the smoothest wrestler I've ever seen. Um, his athleticism is off the charts. Like the fact that he can move like that and he's that strong, like that Northern Lights to deadlift to brain busters, always super impressive to me. Like he, he just makes it look so easy. And then Gargano, I, I mean, I don't like Johnny Gargano promos when like he's just talking on the microphone. I don't find them very impressive. However, I don't know of anybody who tells a better story with their facial expressions in a match. Mm-hmm. Like the, the the whole vanilla midgets thing that was popular to say like 10 years ago could apply to a lot of guys because as athletic as it was, they never seemed to be in any type of duress. There didn't seem to be a lot going on in the match aside from the match. And just the way he fought with the idea of kind of giving in to what, you know, Champa told him he needed to do to get by. Um, it's just incredible. And, you know, it, it's a way for a ricochet to lose, quote unquote, clean, but he still lost to a method he didn't expect to be pulled out in that match. Um, just, you know, fantastic all around. Ricochet's, you know, going to be a star. And right now Gargano is one. Just, uh, I can't think of... You know, like two better guys for each other. I hope they run it back one on one at some point. Just super impressed with everything they did. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you think uh, this is Ricochet wrapping up in NXT and get ready to come up to the main roster, or do you think there's some more stories to tell down there? I think that the fact that EC3 and Heavy Machinery um, came up before, you know, who I call. The, the big four and, and really it's more like a big five or six but the fact that those guys are called up before black champa gargano ricochet velveteen cole um to me says they still want to tell stories with those guys because they don't necessarily know who can be a single star right after them so i think there's still some time for all of them uh, um down there i think there's still some things that have to be settled especially with pete dunn you know pulling a bit of heavier duty with NXT UK. So not just yet. How, however, I think that, you know, NXT has found ways to sustain itself before. Like, you know, 
Finn was all of a sudden gone, and Joe was all of a sudden gone, and Nakamura was all of a sudden gone, and Bobby Roode was all of a sudden gone. Um, so they know what they're doing better than me. I still think that that, that whole contingent still has some time down there. I, I don't think it's Ricochet's time just yet. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Like, like, whatever happens, you know, it's those guys making more money if they get called up, so call them all up. Right. I agree. Um, I think, you know, for as a selfish fan, you know, the guys that's been get the guys and uh, women that's been getting called up to the main roster hasn't necessarily been treated uh, the way a lot of us probably would like them to be treated or used utilized. So selfishly, you know, we want to see them down there and have these great stories and these great matches. But uh, like I always say on these shows, I'm I'm mostly for the wrestlers and them being successful. So you know, NXT is great for the fans and the hardcores that like those matches. But you know, the money is on the main roster and. They're in the business. I mean, everyone's not in the business just for the money, but the money is the business. Um, yeah. The next match, Shayna Baszler defeats Bianca Belair by submission. Uh, so this match, I was not knowing what to expect. I love Bianca Belair, and I love her character, and I thought it would be an entertaining match, but uh, she showed me some things uh, in this match, basically acting as babyface uh, with Shayna and fighting through and – People always talk about, like, oh, it's the moves and selling doesn't have a place in wrestling. Well, in this match and in the Sasha um, Ronda match the next night, like, selling clearly can still make a match. And Bianca was able to sell Shayna Baszler as this killer, and she still fought and fought and fought. But at the end, like, she just wasn't there yet, and the, and the killer still won. Uh, what would you think about this match? I think that we talk about Ronda Rousey kind of being a natural and Kurt Angle being a natural. And those are always like the two names I pull out as, as people who excelled in other sports, even if they were comparable, and just so naturally transitioned to this. Um, I'd say Shayna is, she's number two. Whoever, Whichever one of those you put at number one, Shayna's number two, or she's 1A, um, because she's better than one of them. And pick whichever one you like. Uh, Shayna Baszler is convincing. I think she has, uh, of any woman who's wrestled um, at a high level. I think she is the most intimidating look. She looks like she can beat you up. The best thing about it is uh, Shayna Baszler as a heel did exactly what she said she was going to do. She said, it doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how fast you are. Everybody needs air to breathe. And that's what she went for. Um, I think that I remember a couple of years ago, one of the best stories in sports was Cam Newton finally putting it all together and being unstoppable and throwing a million touchdowns to guys you never heard of. And he gets to the Super Bowl and it's different because you don't score a million points in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, they've been game planning for you for two weeks and they got a good coach on their side and they got good players on their side. And you saw what it was like to have all this success and for the right team to come along and, and stifle that. And everything Bianca Belair was saying up to that point was just so accurate. Um, and she was able to do just about anything. And again, you got to see her humbled, but in a way that a brash baby face should be humbled to come back and work harder the next time. Yeah, I, th I thought it was a fantastic story. Um, I think that th they have such a future with the female talent um, that, you know, well, I'm sure we'll talk about the Rumble later, but a lot of the acts that they have are going to be obsolete because there's so much talent in NXT. And, and Shayna Baszler and Bianca Belair are two of the most talented. Um, just a great match. I, I don't always like the the heel being 100% accurate in what they're saying, but in this case, it fit, and I, I can't wait to see that again. Yeah, and then I also like how, how so I often get a little nervous with, uh, black acts in WWE because oftentimes they're just portrayed as like physical marvels. Like they're the strongest, mm -hmm. they're the fastest. He's so athletic. Like how many times did you watch Shelton Benjamin? And granted, he was ridiculously athletic, but it's like he's the best athlete ever in WWE. He's the best athlete, but like they never win anything or never win the big prize, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But what I liked in this match was yes, they showed that she was strong and fast and athletic. But they gave her those spots at the end to show, like, the fight and the hard work and the grit that you don't often get portrayed often with the with the black ex in WWE. And so to add to her athleticism and her strength, she also showed that, like, she's got some fight in her. She's got some, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to work hard. 
and basically that like you know you got me this time saying it but next time you know i'm gonna be even better and i'm gonna be ready so i i have a feeling they're gonna run that back mania weekend uh for takeover and uh that might be shane it's time to wrap it up and go to the main roster and so you might be seeing uh bianca uh win the nxt women's championship that plus i don't know who else they have ready to be champion unless they go back to Kyrie Sane or Io Shirai, which I kind of think they're going to go up to the main roster and be the tag champs. Um, and then the last match, main event of NXT TakeOver, was Tommaso Ciampa defeating Aleister Black to retain the NXT championship. Uh, Ciampa's just been on a roll recently. Like, this dude's just – he is such a great bad guy in 2019 and 18 where people always cheer the bad guys. Like I said, they're like – one thing that could make some of these matches, like the Johnny Gargano Ricochet match, better is if there was like legit heat, like because everybody liked everybody and just cheered everybody's moves and stuff. And I kind of miss <clears throat> like the bad guy and you getting behind the good guy a little bit, even though you know it's not real, but still getting into that story. And it's kind of hard sometimes when both guys are so great in the ring. But Tommaso Ciampa found a way to be great in the ring, but still have people hate him. And in 2019, that's a big-time accomplishment. Uh, what do you think about this match, Cam? I think that, you know, he's – you go back to May 2017, and you just look at who he's been, the things he said, um, him speaking truth to power, him finding any way to win, um, his ability to get into his opponent's head, his influence over Johnny. Like, he, he's just been – if if you had to split it, between male and female wrestlers of the year, I think you have to go with, you know, Becky Lynch and Tommaso Ciampa. Like, he, he's better than anything they've done on the main roster. And I do think, you know, you get hamstrung and you have to go through so many channels on, on what's approved. But, yeah, he's he's amazing. And the fact that, as a heel, he can, in a credible way, you know, beat an unstoppable Aleister Black because of the things that he's doing, because of sin- it's not just a 50-50 match, but the fact that, you know, he set this up the whole match for his move to not be able to work is, is great. Um, yeah, he, he's he's amazing. And and I'm he's one of the ones I'm almost afraid to go on the main roster because, you know, I, he's miles better than what Bobby Roode was, but Bobby Roode was still good in being that gatekeeper heel and being better than everybody and being important and you not belonging in the ring with him. He was great at that. And, you know, I don't know if, you know, Champ is going to get the opportunity to to be who he is on a show that has so many different figures in the ecosystem. But up until this point, like he, he's been great um, the way that he influenced, again, the way he influenced Gargano and even how that is really what led to him kind of having this power over Al- Aleister Black in the match that they had. Um, yeah, it's just I can't say enough good things about him. And, you know, Aleister Black, who lost um you know, a title match who lost what for the third time lost a singles match, probably for the first time lost a match clean, you know, comes out and eliminates Dean Ambrose the next night. So he's going to be fine too. Um, but yeah, I can't, can't say enough good things about Champa. just um, a, a special talent in a time where they tell you special talents don't exist anymore. Yeah. And I think, I think Alistair, I think he is the one that's wrapping up and going up to the main roster. I don't think they would have him eliminate Dean Ambrose. Uh, my it just for nothing. Uh, usually, yeah. usually they bring guys in or surprises or NXT guys, and they'll eliminate like some just random dude on the roster, some Zack Ryder or you know Kurt Hawkins or just somebody mm-hmm. that they can eliminate. They don't usually take a main eventer and let them eliminate them. The last time I remember that it's probably happened before since then, but I remember when uh, Bo Dallas eliminated like was it Kane or somebody. He eliminated uh-huh. somebody big in the Rumble, and then, you know, he got brought up pretty soon right after that. So, um, I expect to see um, Alistair Black up on the main roster pretty soon. Rich, are you back? I am. I am. I uh, just got out of my garage, so now I got a signal again. All right, cool, cool. So, yeah, we're just wrapping up NXT, and we're about to move on to the Rumble. But uh, any thoughts um, – on any of the matches you didn't get to talk about, um, Baszler and Bianca Belair, or Tommaso Ciampa and Aleister Black? Uh, Baszler. I, I, I'd talk about the ladies because I think it sounds like you guys kind of hit everything I would talk about with Ciampa and Black in terms of like proce- the process of them getting to the main roster. Hello? They must have went through the garage. 
<laughs> Richard, Richard, step out for a second. Uh, you got, <laughs> can you hear? Got, yeah, you're good. Dark. You're good. There you go. <laughs> Rich, are you under the garage? Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rich will jump in when he gets some. Uh, Wait, I think I'm back. All now. right, now you're back. Is. You're back. We can edit that out. Yeah, the <laughs> um, I'm close enough. Like I work at Pitt, so everywhere I, I go, relatively on campus, has like campus Wi-Fi. So I got to turn off the campus Wi-Fi because it'll interrupt with Skype because it's constantly trying to find itself. Oh yeah, same thing. I apologize friend. for that. But yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Shayna. Listen, at this point, Shayna Baszler. The one thing I needed to her to to see out of her was what I saw in that match, and that was seeing a relatively inexperienced opponent get led to a good match. And then on the other side with Bianca Belair, she exceeded my wildest expectations for a person who's relatively new to pro wrestling. She wasn't just being led by the nose. She contributed. She has the facials, the body type, the dynamic, the athleticism. If Vince McMahon gets out of his own way. She could be a star for them by 2020. Oh, absolutely. One of the things I said, and it, I mean, I know the answer to this, but it's incredible to me that it took them this long to get uh, a female track star in as yes. <laughs> like, yeah. like to me, like my whole, like I played, I played a division one football and I spent a lot of time and I running track. I've been to track meets like nothing it's no, there's to me. There's no place I would rather go than to a track meet if I was like trying to recruit for like a women's wrestler. Like they're mm-hmm. athletic, they're strong, like they're most of them are beautiful. Like <laughs> they have all of those traits that WWE looks for in a women's wrestler, and they seem like they just figured that out with Bianca Belair. So like I would imagine, yeah. I would hope they take note of that and keep recruiting from that base because. A lot of those women, they don't get it. They, you know, they go run track overseas and they make good money. But eventually, they come back here, and this is a good way for them to keep making some good money, and also for WWE to get some uh, really good talent. Um, I, mean, I think, yeah. I think aesthetically, like w- when you talk about like the the female athletic body, mm-hmm. I, I don't think that you get a lot higher than uh, track stars and gymnasts, and and I think that. For gymnasts, I think it's a it's a weird transition because it's even though it's competition, a lot of that is uh, subjective, you know. And so I, I don't know if they necessarily see the value in even you know a simulated combat. But I think with yeah with, with track, I just feel like that's a hotbed. And you look like that's the thing that jumps out to you about Bianca, how strong she is, how fast she is, how even though they have this roster full of in shape women, she has a different body than everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, what produced that? What is this unique look that we have? Um, But, yeah, I definitely think that's a route that they need to go because there are so many of them out there. And another thing you don't have to worry about with these type of athletes like. Their any injury that they have a lot of times is going to be non-contact. There's not going to be a lot of miles on the body. You already know what type of work ethic they have to have to maintain that. Yeah, yeah. They should they should hire us to just go to track meets and be like, okay, let's see what she's doing. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. So that wraps up NXT. The next night we had the Royal Rumble uh, from Chase Field. Actually, ooh, so- I just one thing real quick, oh, Brandon. Right. I am so sorry for hijacking your show. No, you're because good. it ties into the Rumble. One of the things I think Bianca does. And Travis and I have been talking about that for years when Sasha was in NXT, is that it starts to create a multitude of black appearance and black Mm -hmm. personality on WWE television. And that's something they have almost never had. Yeah. And and to to jump in there with you, Rich, I think the best thing about Bianca, and it it kind of played out... um, in the match and so it might be something they adjust but her whole thing was like she wasn't sweating Shayna like all the tough talk Shayna was doing she was like no I'm, I'm confident in what I'm gonna do and it reminded me of one the first time that Kane kind of jumped at Daniel Bryan and you're so used to smaller guys kind of cowering with Kane Daniel Bryan was like you know I don't care who you are I don't care how big you are I'm gonna beat you yep. up and it was great um so yeah I, I think that again like the the, the the different black bodies and the different black personalities to show that, you know, people are three dimensional. Y- yeah. Uh, we need more of that. We're getting more of that. And uh, yeah, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so 
do you guys have anything to say about the pre match or you just want to skip that? Because I heard I mean I, I heard the Cruiserweight match was great. I didn't watch it. But I'm surprised Nakamura won the title back. Um that that was interesting in the moment of a pre show. Um so maybe they're doing more there. But yeah, I mean it's it's bad. Like what can you even say about the cruiserweight matches? They're always going to be good and athletic and hard hitting and, and Buddy Murphy is, you know, to come from where he came from in NXT. Um, just to be, to be putting on like these amazing performances, um, you know, more power to that guy, all the success in the world to him. Um, like they have so much talent on the roster. I think more people should be watching 205 live. How many episodes have I seen? I don't know, maybe one, but more people should watch. They should. <laughs> yeah. I think I've seen like maybe a couple episodes. Uh, I think I, I, um, I checked it out a couple of times when, um, What's what's my guy's name? Um, the black dude that was the champion before Buddy Murphy. Um, I forget his name, but when he was champion, Cedric Alexander. Cedric Alexander. How did I forget his name? Cedric. Yeah, when Cedric was champion, I checked it out a couple of times. So I like him, uh, but yeah, Buddy Murphy's great. Um, so the show kicked off with Oscar defeating Be- uh, Becky Lynch by submission to retain the SmackDown Women's Championship. Uh, Rich, were you surprised by this finish? I wasn't because I was, as Cam and I had talked and Travis and I had talked on the East Coast cast, I was looking forward to something happening with Becky so that she could kind of still be in the rumble. What I was surprised by was the viciousness of Asuka transitioning her uh, Empress Lock into a cradle cattle mutilator. Uh, My buddy called it the chicken mutilation (laughs) and just worked that neck and there was no escape. Like there, there was no, just like later on with Brock, there was no escape. You just had to take the loss. Yeah. Yeah. Oscar is so good. And here's the thing. I love Becky Lynch. And I think, uh, she's clear to me, clearly the most popular person on the roster, uh, right now. And, uh, I love, I like her promos. I like her work. But when you, when I was watching this match, you could, to me, you could clearly see that like, Athletically, Oscar is just on a different level than most of the women on, on the main roster. Like Ronda's there, Charlotte's there. I think Charlotte, Ronda, and Oscar on the main roster, and Naomi, but she's not as good as workers. Those three. You, like there were some things where it looked like Oscar had to slow down a little bit for Becky. Um, yes, but that's, and that's fine. not a bad thing. Yeah, that's fine because Becky definitely held her own, and she's very good at what she does. It's just Oscar is so good, and it was kind of upsetting to see them kind of dropped the ball on her because she was so hot when she came up from NXT. But I, they're trying to get all that, that kind of mystique and that aura back to her. And I think this was a, a good step in that direction. Uh, Cam, what do you think about this match? Yeah, I, you know, I, even though I, I don't necessarily agree, I think Rich made a, a really interesting parallel in that, um, you know, between those three being the, the Oscar, Charlotte, and the Becky Lynch, Becky has... Charlotte's number. Charlotte has Oscar's number. Oscar has Becky's number. It's not a direct even Steven, but I do think that 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 makes the the three of them go. It doesn't put anybody heads above the other when it comes to the actual competition. Um, What I assumed was going to happen was that shenanigans were going to take place um, in order for Becky to lose that match. But I, I do think that they're looking at it like, yo, when we get out of WrestleMania, we have two rosters for women. Um, you know, we've built Oscar up all that time in NXT. Maybe we didn't quite go the right way with her WrestleMania, but we don't want to lose out on this act because we're promoting another one. Um, I think that, you know, Oscar's a special talent. We ran and raved about her the entire time she was in NXT, the stuff she did on the main roster. Um, I don't like my top baby face tapping out clean um, to somebody who's who she's on par with. But, um, you know, I, I thought it was a fantastic match. And like Rich said, it was a maneuver you couldn't escape. And, you know, it, it you got the quality match. You don't think less of Becky Lynch because you think so much of Oscar. So, yeah, I, th- I thought it was really good. Uh, yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, next match, uh, The Miz and Shane McMahon defeated The Bar to win the uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championships. Uh, so this was a Shane McMahon match. Uh, I always enjoyed The Miz. It's still weird for me seeing him as, like, a good guy. 
Like, that's just so weird to see him, like, smiling and, like, fighting for the hot tag. It's just weird to me. Um, but, you know, I, th- I thought they had a match about as good as they were going to have with The Miz and Shane McMahon. Cesaro is still just a freak of nature and incredible. And Sheamus, you know, he's very consistent. He's kind of a kind of just a guy, that consistent professional that you can count on to have, you know, three star match or above every every time he comes out there. Um, Rich, what do you think about this match and the Miz and Shane actually winning the belts? Well, I'm gonna steal something from Todd Martin of the Torch because uh, our mission in life is to make Wade's life a living hell when it comes to Shane. <laughs> and uh, kind of like the Asuka triangle with Charlotte and Becky. It's with me, Wade, and uh, Todd when it comes to uh, Shane McMahon, uh, John Cena, and then all of New Japan Pro Wrestling for me as far as them getting me with things. Uh, I thought Shane nailing a shooting star press at 49 better than Brock did at 25 at WrestleMania is something that will never make sense to me. Yes. Good. Uh, I mean, it, it makes sense to me, um, you know, like if. <laughs> but but if it's Cam, think about it this way, though. Think about it this way, Cam. Even if we use like that's where I get weighed with it. It's the checkmate for me with him with that. Even if you think about the fact that Shane's a deleton and Shane has every advantage possible in terms of recoup. Him at age forty nine has more wear on the tires, more concussions, and more things wrong with him than Brock as a fresh 25-year-old trying that move against Cape Kurt Angle. I mean, I, and, and I hear you. There's also pressure on Brock to perform at there's 25. There's pressure on Shane. He's got there's, daddy there's, in the back. There's, there's absolutely not pressure on Shane to do well. <laughs> like, I, I, I won't ride with that. Like, I, I won't rock. I think that Shane is – he's clearly athletic. Like, like, don't let me say that he's not. Shane – is one of the best imitators of a wrestler out there. Um, but that's what he is. He's imitating wrestling. He's not wrestling. Um, Shane, and it was a perfect shooting star press. Don't let me pretend like it's not. Oh, yeah. But it's like it's like going to a quarterback competition, right? If you are the guy whose dad runs the competition and you get to sit in on all the camps – um, you'll look good when it comes to doing the stuff in the competition. If, if you're the kid who's a supernatural at it and has some training, but hasn't actually like been to that specific camp, and doesn't know the things they're asking for, you won't do as well. Like Shane gets all the answers to the tests um, and more time to study than everybody. So yeah, it was you know he can do cool stuff sometimes, um, and and is willing to put his body on the line. I won't take that away from him. He also gets way longer vacations. Um, so, you know, like I'm, I'm happy for Seamus and Cesaro and Miz to be in a program with somebody who's going to get attention. Hopefully they got a better payday by being on the card with that guy. But yeah, whatever. Yeah. Shane to me is like Kirk Cousins, where it's like either the people who like him go way too far in praising the dude. And then the people who hate him find every reason to like hate the dude. So like in general, so like Shane Clearly, he don't wrestle every week and every day, so he can do things that other people aren't allowed to do, which kind of makes him stand out, which could be it could be unfair. But also, man, when that dude does get in the ring, he works harder than almost anybody else works, and he does seem like he cares. So there's that both sides of it that I see people talk about all the time. But uh, I, I enjoy some of his matches, but sometimes it can get a little nauseating because, like, Here's the thing. Shaming man has to go home and watch his matches sometimes. But he goes home and he watches himself give those punches. And then every time he comes back out, he keeps giving those punches. So I don't How know, he still can't punch. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know what this is about. Like, does he go home and watch that and think it looks good? Is, is Vince telling him it looks good? Like, there's no way Triple H is telling him that looks good. So, like, I don't know how that keep happen, keeps happening. And then, to exacerbate that, they focus on those punches. They zoom in. And they go, look at Shane McMahon with these strikes. And he's in the corner, like, doing 7,000 punches. And the thing is, the worst thing about Shane's punches, I don't want to stay on that, but the worst thing about Shane's punches is they look so bad. But when you watch him, it looks like he's, like, literally potatoing the guys, like, punching them in the face. (laughs) But they look horrible. So, like, I'm getting punched in the face, and then it doesn't even look good. Like, at least if I'm going to get hurt, make it look good. You know, 
I don't know if The Rock's punches were good. I know they were really exaggerated, and The Rock's very athletic, and so there's that going for it. Like, Kurt Angle, I think, is, like, the best wrestler I've ever seen. Kurt Angle's punches are an imitation of Rock's punches. Mm -hmm. But it's, I think it's the It's also the effort that you put into what you do. And again, Shane tries really, really hard, but there's no way, like, he thinks that those short rabbit punches are aesthetically pleasing. (laughs) Like, it's impossible. Like, you're not reaching from anywhere. You're not extending. Like, it's it's, it's really bad. And I, I think it's a detriment to the matches because guys don't know how they're supposed to sell those. Cause, cause what do you do? How do you move? when somebody does that to you like with rock and angle they're cocking so far back and going to your face you know to turn your head because the exaggerated motion does that i don't know shane's just kind of poking at you and he does those body punches so it's really like awkward sometimes yeah. for people Should to sell. fall or yeah but okay yeah we've you're right we said enough about yeah, shane we, i apologize no right, it's fine <laughs> uh the next match was my favorite match of the night uh, Ronda Rousey defeating Sh- Sasha Banks to retain the Raw Women's Championship. Uh, Ronda is just like, I think she's exceeded everyone's expectations. I remember when she signed, and you know, I would hear people call into the torch or uh, on Twitter, and they'd be like, oh, they're going to give Ronda this money. They're going to push her. She don't care about the business, blah, blah, blah. But clearly, like, she cares. She's worked hard. She's picked this up ridiculously fast. She's really, really good at what she does. She's good at the small things that, like, usually takes people years to figure out. She's kind of picked up quickly. And then this, to me, was a reminder because Sasha Banks has kind of been lost in the shuffle. Like, you've had Ronda, you've had Becky, and you've had Charlotte, and they're getting a lot of the praise. And then Oscar wins the belt, and that's kind of who's been featured. And they kind of had Sasha in those stupid segments with Bailey for so long that you forgot that, like, if you go back to like a year ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago, like Sasha seemed like she was going to be the big star out of all of them. And she came out and put on a performance um, yesterday that to me just made Ronda look great, made herself look great, and was just a fantastic match. Um, it looks like Rich is on mute. Uh, Cam, what'd you think? Yeah, I think that, you know, Sasha Banks is, depending on who you ask, they say Sasha's the best woman's wrestler you know, in the world. And I, I do think she's, she's stellar. I think she can do all the moves. I think she is very hyper aware of what's going on in the ring. Um, her selling and her size also always makes her opponents look good. So you, I can't say enough good things about Sasha Banks in the ring. Um, you know, I put a poll out. I said, is Ronda Rousey on track to be the best female in ring performer ever? Um, most people say no. I, I, I think it's worth the conversation. Um, she's picked up on this thing so fast. And, you know, Ronda in her UFC days, not that she couldn't do it, but Ronda wasn't known for takedown after takedown after takedown. You know, um, but yeah, she has found a way to just incorporate her athleticism into wrestling. She's doing moves that other women's wrestlers and even male wrestlers just don't do she has a crispness i mean her her hips just allow her to follow through with these moves her submission games great um when she's under duress she sells it great i i I can't say enough um she's she's incredible she she really is incredible as a performer um who knows if her personality is ever going to come over in a way to where she can be transcendent. But as far as the wrestling part of wrestling, I, I don't I don't know anybody who's caught on faster and gotten this good in such a short period of time. Uh, Rich, you back? Okay, yes, cool. sir. Yeah, what do you think about this match? Well, first, I'll start with Rhonda since y'all were talking about her, and I'll bounce back to uh, uh, Miss uh, Miss Banks. I think. Uh, Rhonda is magnificent. I think politics aside, you got that's my big politics, horrible husband, really <laughs> dumb life choices. There's aside. some issues. Yeah. There's yeah. some issues. In the ring, she's magnificent. And she, I put her, I don't even know if I can put her a step behind because at this point, I got a guy I threw an argument my way that I did not receive this morning on Twitter because I said the main event women's division is more vicious and more technically sound than the men's 
like for like in the last year and, and the person mentioned like AJ Styles and I, I was like I'm not talking just about AJ Styles I'm talking about as a division when there's a big match you feel it when you see the women wrestle and I think Ronda has reached not only the Kurt apex of being such a good pe- catch of it she's at that Brock level of when she wants to work with somebody you can see how much she's putting into it how much she's selling I mean the way she sold climbing that rope was something a tenure some tenure vets don't do when you watch rest, when you watch uh, WWE matches, mm-hmm. and then when you flick the Sasha, I haven't seen that level of vision since her NXT Brooklyn fight against Bailey. I mean, when she had her in the bank statement and and pulled out the piece of her ring attire to basically reenact the Johnny Gargano, uh-huh. uh, Champa face mask with the knee brace, like she was just in a dark place, and I liked how she was aggressive and not. The skinny, oh, woe is me, woe is me. She went for it, man, and I loved it. Yeah, and uh, I like the post-match. It looks like Sasha may be becoming a bad guy, which, you know, might be a good thing for the uh, Raw brand to see. And it kind of makes me sad because I kind of want to see, like, this program continue, even though I know they're going to go into Becky and Ronda pretty soon. Uh, but-, but here's the beauty of it, Brad. We got – as much as it like it blows my mind that this is possible, but when I was doing the deep dive Saturday, my buddy Justin pointed out they got two full months and two full pay per views between now and Mania. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, so we might, it's wild. Yeah, we might get the continuation of this, so we'll see. She put up the four fingers. I don't think uh, Justin Duke and um, Marina Shafir Marina Shafir are ready to come up on the main roster for a big match yet. Like, I just don't think they're ready. But um, I think at some point in the next, you know, maybe year and a half, uh, we're going to get that match, uh, and it's going to be good. Um, Then we had uh, the Women's Royal Rumble. Uh, Becky Lynch won the Royal Rumble in an hour and 12 minutes. Um, Cam, what would you think about this match? I think that it does show the lack of – not the lack of depth necessarily, but it shows you that they're trying to serve two masters in a way that they don't do on the male roster. There's nobody on the male roster that's there because they're good looking with hopes that their athleticism comes across. Um, the female roster absolutely has that. And when you put them in a situation like a Royal Rumble, it exposes a lot because there's just less things that they can do. Um, there's more space being occupied. Like everybody's not Ember Moon. Everybody's not Sonya Deville. Everybody's not Becky Lynch. Everybody's not Charlotte. And it does make talent like that really stand out. But like, I, you know, I'm such a fan of... Maria Kanellis for her career, what she's been able to do, and also how much she's benefited of Mike Kanellis. Um, and I mean in life, not just talking about wrestling. But when a Maria Kanellis gets in a Royal Rumble, it's evident that mm-hmm. she doesn't belong there um, from an athletic standpoint. You know, um, I do think that who it came down to in the end is exactly how it should have played out. I, I think that. They didn't reach for nostalgia like the last time, and I think that's good. I think like a rare Ripley and um, what's the um, Rich help me out the um, the Chinese lady's name, Zai Li, Zai Li, Zai Li, yeah, yeah, who um, who, who was a talent? I think you got to see some of these like these NXT talents, um, but yeah, it just they, they would have benefited from going twenty and not thirty, and I think that you can justify that. Um, the way that Becky Lynch got into it, um, because they needed an alternate, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's, that's a good way for a baby face to be involved in something without seeming like they were gifted something. Charlotte's reaction to it all just incredible. Like she has such a mean streak, not just with her physicality, but her facial expressions. Um, the highs of that match, I really liked. I think that a lack of roster depth as far as talent goes um, took away from that, and they would have benefited by from having 10 less people in that match. Yeah, the last 10 minutes were great. I will say this. The, my biggest issue with what you brought up, Cam, is that 
I have no problem with them just having, you know, beautiful women who can talk or act or what have you. But, like, I don't understand why. It's the same thing with the men, honestly. But I don't understand why everyone has to work. Why everyone has to be a wrestler. Like, like Leo Rush, right? Just have him be a manager. Even if he can work, he's annoying. He can be a very good talker. He can be someone's manager. He doesn't have to go in there and wrestle every time. Or uh, Maria Canellas can, can be – she was a great manager in Ring of Honor. Like really good, uh, uh-huh. and it, uh, and an impact. Uh, she was really good with uh, Mike Canella. So, like, let her be a manager, and that's okay. Like, let Lana be a manager. Lana doesn't have to get a women's championship match. Carmella doesn't have to be a wrestler. Her and our truth thing is really good. Like them doing um, that show is really good. Like sometimes it's okay to let wrestlers wrestlers wrestle because when you bring the other people in. It's like the male, ver- like you said, they don't have the male good looking person. Just hope the athletic ver- comes out. The male version of that is like the big guy. Like they get some seven foot tall guy or some giant and they go. Agreed. Agreed. Gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to, you're going to be good. And then we, we hope you develop into something good. And then sometimes they don't ever develop into anything good. They can't talk. They can't work. They're just big. And that's the male version of it. And sometimes you got to play to people's strengths and they try to make everybody have all the strengths uh rich what'd you think about um the women's rumble oh rich is on mute okay uh so we'll go to daniel bryan and aj oh, oh no there you I'm go i'm sorry what'd you think about no the i women's thought it was rumble? good i thought the issue is the yeah i thought the first third was rough because it was like the vince mcmahon platonic ideal of women's wrestling and then the last third was triple h's platonic ideal of women's wrestling and <laughs> It was just rough in the middle there because my buddy was keeping track, even with the title match. He, he didn't, he ran out of time by the end of the night, but he was like, I wonder how far back I got to go before I find a women's title match that didn't have at least one of either the champion or the challenger blonde. And that first third kind of illustrated that because out of the first 12 competitors, eight were blonde. It was just ridiculous. And then by the time you got to the end, I mean, you, you kind of got it, the good women. Like you had Io Shirai, you had um, – uh, who else was there? Uh, her girl, um, Pirate Princess. Kyrie uh, Kyrie Sane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they were there, but they never got to do tag moves because Kyrie got eliminated and then she was looking for a homegirl to help out when she was getting jumped by the Riot Squad. So little things like that, the more you can – accentuate the good stuff they could have booked that in a way where you had those same 30 women and you would be like you know what that wasn't bad but they instead went with the uh, let's just get this to where we needed to go and god bless fit Finley for being the 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 person that kept there he was like the chuck norris and dodgeball everyone's like waiting with bated breath if he's gonna let her in or not uh, but yeah i thought that was good the finish was good i think as cam mentioned charlotte when she has an attitude it's outstanding to see and that new uh, like she just has a new swagger about her since she's come back. And uh, I thought overall it was clunky, but the ends justified the clunky means. Yeah. And the thing about this match is like, it's the things that worry you with Vince and Kevin Dunn and that whole main roster, like the way the announcers talked about Mandy Rose and Lacey Evans and the oh, way yeah. they were Great featured music. is just like, is this where they're going to go? Like, is this what they're going to learn from this? Because, like, Lacey Evans, I'm, and I'm not even trying to knock her. There was no reason for her to be in that match for 30 minutes. Like, there wasn't. And she was getting featured spots, and she was messing them up, and because she's not ready yet. And But she's blonde, and she's tall, and she was in the military. So, you know, Vince is going to love her. And so she's going to get featured. Mandy, Mandy Rose is beautiful, but, like, Corey Graves being creepy on commentary, just t- constantly talking about her, it's, it seems like – they still want to, like, like their dream is, like, oh, Mandy Rose can work like Oscar. But Mandy Rose is not going to work like Oscar. And that's okay. But, like, if you start pushing her in the, uh, better than people like Oscar and things like that, then it, it can become a problem. But they're not there yet, so let's, uh, let's hope that they're not. Also, I will say this. I was kind of impressed with Dana Brooke in this match. She, mm-hmm. she was very doing, athletic. Yeah, she's ridiculously athletic. She doesn't often get the show when they put her in matches on Raw. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if she can kind of keep that up, I think she has some potential as well. So I was kind of, uh, happy to see, uh, her able to do some things. Um, WWE championship match, Daniel Bryan defeats AJ Styles with the help of Eric Rowan. 
Uh, this match kind of got put in a death spot, and the crowd was just, like, not into it at all. And they were doing very good technical moves and having a good match and trying to tell a decent story. But I think this match would have been – and, and I'm not the guy that's usually like this, but I think this would have been a better match if AJ and Brian would have said, you know, we're going to come out and have, like, an NXT title-type match, like, with a little bit more uh-huh. high spots, a little bit more action – a little bit more movement and more fast pace. They go; those guys can do it. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to do a really good, technically sound, excellent wrestling match, and it was that. But at this point in the show and this long show with this crowd, it just kind of died. Um, Cam, what'd you think? Yeah, it, it was the night where you don't do that. Um, title matches at the Royal Rumble are typically shorter for a reason because they're not the focus. Um, you know, AJ and Daniel Bryan being absolute masters of their craft probably went out there and did, uh, you know, move for move, blow for blow, exactly what they wanted to do. But when a crowd's been in the building for four hours um, and they've had this go, 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 go thing like a Royal Rumble, um, I, I don't think it fit. Um I, there's a lot of speculation that what Eric Rowan is doing was what Lars Sullivan was supposed to do. Um, and so that's interesting. I, I think that they, they keep trying to do this thing with Rowan, who's probably a great guy, but they, they literally put him in the same spot year after year after year as being the second or third you know, being a big to whoever's the champion or big act at that time. So I don't know if that's beneficial to him, but, you know, get your checks. Um, like, I, I don't know. AJ is, I don't know if this is the end of what they do or if they keep feuding. I'd love to see AJ in something new, though, because I think that as the better this Daniel Bryan character gets, the more his style is going to change. And I think even though AJ can wrestle any style, AJ needs an Almas or somebody, you know, to that effect who can create a bunch of movement to make AJ look special. Um, Yeah. I I just think that those two, as good as they are, need to get away from each other before it becomes super stale. Um, Again, good match, but imagine that match in at takeover uk right. as opposed to at the royal rumble and i think it, it gets it's a totally different vibe and we walk out of that feeling different um rich what where do you think daniel bryan goes at wrestlemania with the wwe championship because to me it seemed like they're setting up as hard as this is for me to say mustafa ali or samoa joe which i think a lot of people would like to see uh in the championship match at wrestlemania but where do you think they're going to go with that well, I, I think because of those two pay-per-views, we're in a weird spot. I think he can either be underneath re-challenging to get his title back after Fastlane, or he could be defending against someone that they've put the rocket strap to. Like, for instance, if they threw all the money at Kenny Omega and he shows up in February, that'd be a match. If they decide they want to push Aleister Black or one of the newer NXT people, like even if it is a Lars, that's great. But if they're just going to go with Pat, I'm, I would say, gosh, right off the top of my head, I would say, a since he's a heel, I would go with a face on SmackDown. That's tough. That's Rusev. I'll say Rusev. Okay, Ken, where do you think that Daniel Bryan, if he still has the belt uh, in a couple months of Mania, who do you think his opponent will be? I am kind of in line with the uh, with the line of thinking about Mustafa Ali. Um, he seems to be the baby face that's kind of up there at this point. Um, I, I think a Daniel Bryan Rey Mysterio, you know, WWE title match would just be amazing. Um, but I, th- I do think you run into maybe the same problem that you run into with um, with AJ, in that that might not be the pace Daniel Bryan is necessarily trying to go right now. And I think. Like a Mustafa Ali, he could spend a lot of time grounding Mustafa Ali with him once in a while, you know, pulling out this special move and then it picking up pace at the end. Uh, but yeah, I'd say right now it does look like a smaller guy, like a Mysterio or Mustafa Ali. Um, I don't know if anybody else is going to be, you know, hot enough at that point. I'm, I'm, you know, did sit against it being like a Randy Orton because why? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I would say I'm more in line with your way of thinking about Mustafa Ali at this point. Um, then we got the 
WWE Universal Championship match, which they actually did what we were just talking about. Brock Lesnar defeated Finn Balor by submission. They came out. They had an eight-minute match. It was all fast-paced, all hard-hitting, lots of movement, uh, got the crowd back into the show. Uh, Brock was doing an excellent job selling. for. He basically sold for Finn the entire match. Uh, and then Finn hit his move, and then Brock kind of kicked out and put him in the Kimura and got the submission. Um, Rich, what did you think about the Universal Championship match? I loved it. I think this suffered from the opposite of everything you said, as you mentioned just now. You had a 25, 30-minute match with the WWE title with the Universal. You had an eight-minute street fight, even though they used wrestling moves. And Brock, I think the greatest lie that Deborah ever told was that Brock Lesnar hates wrestling. Brock Lesnar hates wrestling for free. And as you learn in any job, in any part of your life, if somebody's going to pay you to do something, you want the maximum amount of money to do it. And I think a lot of people fall into I even have some friends who aren't as like they're into it, but then they, they psych themselves out. Like I went in their chat and they were all mad because it's like, man, Brock, I hate the very essence of Brock Lesnar. It's like, well, why do you hate it? Because he just doesn't it's like you know he shows up and Vince tells him not to go out. And then he says, Vince, Brock didn't show up and he's getting paid not to show up, even though he showed up. Like he's doing his job. Now, if you want to talk like <coughs> Cam knows, uh Travis always complained about the thing with the Ambrose. <laughs> It's clear he didn't respect Dean Ambrose mm-hmm. because the three matches he had with Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, tw- the two matches with AJ Styles, and the match he just had with Finn Balor, those mm-hmm. are four four matches where he brought it. He sold. He sold like death, and every time he won, it was despite his worst night. It wasn't like he looked like he slipped on a banana pill every single time those men brought it and he felt like he was like iron chipens are and he was the guy who kind of escaped he didn't he didn't just death clutch his way like he did the john cena for instance yeah yeah and yeah. that didn't the match with dean ambrose come like a couple months before his ufc fight like i yeah. could have sworn i was like mm-hmm. right before he went back to the ufc it was, and he wanted to do like barbed wire and all this other stuff and he was like nah i'm good yeah, yeah he's like yeah i'm not i'm not with that and so and i can't listen i can't ever knock Brock Brock Lesnar for being a good businessman. Like the idea that like fans get mad because like he gets paid a lot of money is just like so baffling. I mean, I understand. And he's part-time. Yeah, and he's part like I like I'm a sports fan, so I get the idea of how ridiculous fans are. But mm-hmm. like he he what what would you rather like if you were in that situation, you're gonna be like, nah, I want to go out there every Monday night. Like Brock understands that he helps the business a lot by him not wrestling every week and him doing a bunch of and him coming every once in a while uh for matches because it creates an aura around his matches and as much as people get to, like i remember travis was talking about this and i agreed with him in this is like the brock from back in the day used to wrestle you know he'd do wrestling moves and all types of suplexes and run the ropes and you know like a wrestler and this brock lesnar just does suplexes and <laughs> f5s and submissions and I, although I would like to see him do a little bit more of sometimes, when he he does those things with such an intensity that it it creates, like, an aura of importance to his matches. And so whenever he has a match, like, I remember that Goldberg match, right? And I, I was on Twitter and seeing some wrestling fans go, I can't believe they had a six-minute WrestleMania world title match. Like, this is bullshit or whatever. And I'm just like, that match was amazing. <laughs> like, I thought that match was an amazing match. and But some people didn't like it because he wasn't out there doing what, you know, having a 40-minute Kenny Omega match, which I think there's right. people need to remember, like, there's room in wrestling for a bunch of different matches. And everything Shoot. doesn't have to be this technical match. Go ahead, Rich. Sorry for cutting you off. Oh, no, I was gonna, no, no, no. I'm good. You're running this show. Yeah. Two things. One, when it comes to that match, that was to me, my mindset was, and I even said it at the time when we were there, I looked at it like, and y'all anime hit, like this was Ultraman, like Goldberg, because all throughout the whole thing leading to WrestleMania, he's like, I, only, I don't know how much I got left in me. It hurts. I poop 18 times a day. My kids see me like just miserable. Like I, I am trying so hard to maintain this body and be the superhero I need to be to defend this title. Like he knew Ultraman only had so many minutes and Brock was just trying to burn him out and he's trying to burn Brock out and I loved it. And then when you get to this match, same thing. And when you get to when people want these, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, masturbatory like exercises and stardom, that's great. That, that That's what you want. But 
if you look like when when people look at like say Dave Meltzer's five stars, sure he'll have a 65, 68, 72 minute Kenny Omega match as a five star. You know what else is a five star? A seven minute Ishii match against uh I want to say it was uh I want to say it was either Suzuki or uh my dude who got crippled, and both of those matches are great. Yeah. There's room for all types of matches in professional wrestling. Cam brought up like some people being young and don't remember the Road Warriors. Like so often, we're all in the Twitter space and we see the people. Oh, these guys are just big dudes. And like, like when I was growing up, like and people got to forget, kids watch this stuff. There's something about seeing two six foot six, two hundred and eighty pound dudes just beating the hell out of somebody. Like. That can be – that is entertaining. Two big dudes in a fight can be entertaining. Braun Strowman can have entertaining matches. That doesn't mean you got to have a whole roster full of them, which is what WWE got into trouble with before. There should be a variety. You should be able to have Finn Balor's and Daniel Bryan's as well as Brock Lesnar's and uh, Braun Strowman's. And I think this match was the epitome of all of that. Finn is small. He's clearly smaller than Brock Lesnar. He's tiny when you see him in the ring with Brock Lesnar. But at no point in this match did you think Finn Balor shouldn't be in a r- r- match with Brock Lesnar. And so uh, I think they did an excellent job of telling this story. And then lastly, um, Seth Rollins wins the Royal Rumble, the men's Royal Rumble. I don't think that was a surprise to anybody. Uh, Cam, what were your thoughts on the men's uh, Royal Rumble? Really quick um, about the uh, the Brock Balor match. Sometimes it's fun to throw rocks. Sometimes it's fun to play with shotguns. Um, Brock has matches with shotguns, and that's perfectly fine because the splatter is always really cool. Um, <laughs> a long match, a short match. If a match is good, it's good. That's um, such I actually a do Texas have to analogy. run. Yeah, just shotguns, you know. Um, but no, um, I do have to run. But let me say this: um, the right guy won the rumble. There's no way that match should have been last. Um, but yeah, I'll um, hang on for a second to see if I can get back with you guys. Uh, but I'll be back. Okay, no problem, Cam. Uh, Rich, what do you think about this match? I thought that, you know, right guy won, especially the way he won. I mean, when you have that commuter out of nowhere and you, you, you show that Finn has kind of like taken him to his limit and he's selling it like – and then afterwards he gets to hit him with spam him with like the signature and the finisher because he's angry that he had to admit weakness to this little man. And that makes him a bully, and that makes him someone you want to boo, and that makes him someone that you want to boo when Seth Rollins fights him at WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the Royal Rumble match was the Royal Rumble match. I think everybody kind of got what they were expected. Um, it was at the end of a long show, so I was just really waiting to see, like, okay, how they're going to do this. And Seth won, and that's cool, because I think the Seth Brock match would be good, but that match definitely shouldn't have went on last. Um and it was okay for what it was, but uh, they just got to do a better job of shortening these shows up. Like they just, they have to because it's, it's just, we'll do. it's just too long. Uh, so I usually try to keep these under ninety minutes. So just a few more things we want to go through outside of wrestling. Is that cool, Rich? Yes, but I will have to leave probably in the next ten minutes or so to go do my interviews for my day job. All right, cool. So we'll wrap this up in ten minutes. Uh, yes. No, not a problem. Uh, so there's a new segment we're doing on the show called The Week of Twi- on Twitter where we talk about some things that happen on the Twitter machine that were kind of big in our little social media bubbles. Um, so that Roger Stone raid, how funny was that? Can you imagine the FBI rolling up to your house at 5.30 in the morning without you knowing? And did you see Chad Johnson's tweet about a guy named Roger in my neighborhood <laughs> got the FBI raided him? Yeah, I, I don't know what was crazier, the fact that you have that happen or that your neighbor's Chad Johnson and he sees the whole thing happening while he's on his jog. <laughs> like, life's funny sometimes. That is... And then Roger Stone is a dude that's like, for those who don't know him, he was like an assistant to an assistant to uh, Richard Nixon when he was younger. And so he's obsessed with Richard Nixon to the point where he has a Richard Nixon tattoo on his back and he lifts. So he's like one of those MAGA dudes who are like, come at me, bro, and he means it. So... <laughs> Like, to think you're the toughest dude in the streets, and then you get dudes rolling up for free at the time, mind you, to, to handle business, that's wild. Yeah, that that was definitely a wild scene. Uh, and those dudes were probably like, uh, you know what, I am not coming into work today. And the boss is like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know we're going to get Roger today. And they were like, you know what, 
Let me let me get my gun. I I think I can make it today. I think I can come in for this. I bring coffee for everybody. I'll meet y'all. I'll meet y'all in the suburb. They were kind of happy about that. Um, other thing, uh, those racist white Catholic school kids uh, antagonizing um, and some indigenous people at a, a protest uh, in D.C. last week. Um, and then the kid, of course, having rich parents, so they hire like a PR firm and they put out this weak statement. And then the news media, of course, gobbles it up and, and puts the statement out and like, this is just a misunderstanding and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, at what point, one, I, you know what? They are kids. You know, I will admit they are kids, but I just wish like our kids could get that treatment sometimes when we do something stupid. Cause yes, it's entirely possible. Unlikely. I think it's highly unlikely, but it is entirely possible that this kid learns from this moment. And he grows up to be a productive member of society. That's not racist. I don't think it's likely, but it's possible. But we don't give black and brown kids this this level of uh, ability to make mistakes and grow. And just the just the whole notion of everything that's happened since then it's kind of been ridiculous. Rich, have you uh, caught up with that story? Oh yeah, unfortunately, that stuff. Like you said, it's in the, it's in our space. And as a father of a six year old turned seven in March, I keep, I keep a special track of this just because it's so like I keep not wanting to think about how close it's starting to become uh, as far as like, oh, wow, he could have this happen or this could be a place he's involved in. Someone says something stupid. Uh, I, I just I'm, I'm flabbergasted at people not asking the right questions because it started as, oh, wow, this Native American gentleman really stood and did well. Oh, well, we found out the black Israelites yelled at them. And I'm like, well, I'm from Brooklyn. Black Israelites yell at you for a bevy of years. <laughs> like, I, 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 don't, I don't see how that's an issue. And then it became, well, if you look at the other angle, he got in their way. Or if you look at this, or he had a criminal record and these kids were catcalling women. And now the person who put the video up is getting shut down by Twitter. And oh, by the way, he's 14, 15, 16 years old and he has a PR firm working for him over the weekend that happens to work with every major Republican uh, nominee. And, oh, wow, the Today Show is now looking after having had Megyn Kelly to excuse his behavior as he was just a little boy. And like you said, we don't get that mistake. Trevon Martin didn't get that opportunity. I also remember on Twitter, like, this journalist was like, I have his name, but he's a kid, and I don't think it's fair to put his name out. And then, like, a day later, there's a Today Show post of them with his full name and everything like, we're about to interview this kid. And I'm like, look how ridiculous you sound. Like, don't you – like, I want to I wanted to uh, right. tweet that journalist. Like, don't you feel ridiculous right now? Like, you got to feel absolutely ridiculous after being played like this. Because it happens over and over. It's like, watch and repeat, watch and repeat. Uh, and then the last big thing <laughs> was those Firefest documentaries, uh, one on Hulu and one on Netflix. Rich, were you able to watch either of those? I saw the Netflix one and uh, that screen cap that's been going around will never not be funny. Like I used it for Daniel Bryan when he said that boomers steal from the generations and just take and take and take and we're sick of it. And I was like me right now and a little picture of him. I was like, this is like that whole. And then on top of that, then you get my dude on the side saying, well, I was hoodwinked, bamboozled, let us stray. <laughs> I too was wrong. And I'm like, you You were in the video with these dudes. Don't let your color try to be the thing you hide behind when you're just as dirty as these fools are. And he's out there with another scam now, like doing something else. And I'm just like, and the other thing is, this was a documentary on white privilege at its finest. Like, from all accounts, <laughs> the, that uh, Ben McFarlane dude has never yeah. succeeded at anything. All of his ventures fail. And somehow he keeps getting more money to start another venture that fails. Like, over and over and over and over again. And I'm just like, I would love for someone to give me money just to start something once. And if I failed, I would not ex I would not have a reasonable expectation that I'm going to get this money again. And he's gotten it at least four times on different things. So, yeah, that, that go watch those Fire Festival documentaries. And also, just know that, like, there's things that I will do for water – what that guy said he'd do for water is not one of the things I'll be doing for water. Nah. No, I'm, nah. I'm not that thirsty. Um, I can wait. Um, and then there's a few topics, and then we'll let Rich talk about the show, and then we'll get out of here because I know he has to go. Um, let's just do a couple of these. I'll save these some of these for next week. Um, so James McAvoy thinks Disney is going to do something different with X-Men. Uh, no shit, James. 
Uh, Rich, did you see the? Did you see that footage from um, Dark Phoenix that's supposed to come out? I uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, it's, it's it's wild. I'm actually excited for that movie because of how bad I think it's going to be. <laughs> that is the best send off. But then we're going to still. I think they didn't they film New Mutants, so they, that might be the last one. Yeah, but I don't think that's going to come out. I don't think okay. Come... By then, Disney's gonna be like, "Let's just put this in the fine. <laughs> yeah, put this in rice, please. Um, they'll give that. They'll give that a D, as a DLC for like Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Aquaman became DC's most successful film ever, passing um, Batman, the third Batman, and the Nolan trilogy. Um, I gotta admit, I did not think Aquaman was gonna make this much money. Um, were you surprised by the success of this film, Rich? I was I was so surprised by the success. I went prior to you sending me the the show notes to see Aquaman Sunday or Saturday. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I saw it Saturday, and I really liked it. Now that is no representation of uh, any version of Arthur from the comic books, <laughs> but I much like I I have fully given in after by the end of that movie. I will put Jason Momoa with The Rock, Nick Cage. Tom Cruise and <laughs> anyone else who's playing themselves in a movie, and I am good with that. Yeah, he definitely was Jason Momoa underwater. Um, I had some issues with the film, but the film was better than the other ones. And people like yes. Jason Momoa. I don't know how this is going to translate to a sequel, but for this film, uh, DC got their money's worth, and they should be happy with that. But hopefully, um, they'll still try to be better. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is I know I saw on Twitter that you went and saw Glass. Um, what'd you think about that film? Listen, Glass is problematic because if you don't like M. Night Shyamalan, you're not gonna like Glass because it is the M. Night Shyamalaniest M. Night Shyamalan movie ever made in terms of like false finishes and switcheroos and all that fun stuff. I loved it because I I wish he was here because Cam's biggest fear before it came out was the it was going to be a movie that had been two movies about superhero supervillains that was p played on a lower scale and they still did that but they did it in a way that forced you to think they were going to do it on a bigger scale and that's where the conflict came in so I was fine with it I thought the twists were great <laughs> but they were also weird also McAvoy is just incredible it, in Split and in this movie like he is incredible in those films um but did you see that m night Shyamalan commented on if he would ever do a marvel film or a dc film uh would you be in for m night Shyamalan marvel mcu movie or a dc eu movie i think if someone like like if i would say dc more than marvel because i don't think he could survive working with uh <laughs> feige it's feige would be like nah bro you can't, you can't be you can't just cheat nah bro and then that would just lead to shenanigans. Now I apologize, but I have to run into this uh, interview. No, thanks. Thank you so much, Rich, uh, for joining. I'll do plugs for you guys' show. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So uh, that was Rich Fan and Cameron Hawkins. Uh, we're going to get out of here uh, today. But uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, you can find Rich Fan on the PW Torch Deep Dive. He records every Saturday. Uh, just go to pwtorch.com and look under livecast and you'll see that i've been on the show uh people from like deep on from mtr network's been on the show he talks about wrestling and dives into different topics every week so definitely go and check that show out also uh, you can follow him on rich underscore fan on twitter and then cameron hawkins you can find him on twitter at seahawk uh, he hosts the east coast cast every wednesday it was literally the first black wrestling show that i ever found on the internet uh, definitely one of my favorites is the must listen to him and Travis Bryant talk about wrestling in a different way. And other people, they have callers come in, they discuss things in a unique way. Cam does his polls. It's just an excellent, excellent wrestling show. Uh, also on the PW uh, Torch website family. Uh, so definitely go check out Rich and Fam, and uh, I got to thank them for coming on the show. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcast app. Leave us a five-star review. It helps us out a lot. You can also subscribe on Spotify now. Uh, so definitely uh, check out the show, share the show. Uh, we have a, our few reviews coming out. We're going to be doing an Oscars preview coming up after the nom nominations this past weekend. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and we will be back soon.